Um, I like to open up with this slide always so you know what's coming. Uh, the guy down there with the suit is me. Uh, it, we're going to see a lot of data. Uh, we're going to go through a lot of different charts. Um, but really, I'm going to keep it at a high level strategically. Uh, my job in the central office is to work with campuses to make sure that their student success plans are on target, provide centralized support when needed to support their, uh, their, their services as well. So a little bit about who we are, uh, just a couple slides to give you the context. Uh, ben mentioned 23 universities throughout the state of California. Uh, the, Cal the state of California has three uh, institutions of higher education, three systems. There's the UC system, the University of California system, which is probably most familiar to you because they're most similar to the University of Maryland. So these are our R1 institutions, the UCLA's, the Berkeley's, um, th those folks. On the other end, we have our community colleges. There's 114 community colleges throughout our state. Uh, and we're right in the middle there with 23 campuses, half a million students. Uh, a little bit about our students, about half of them are the first uh, in their families to go to college, their first generation. 40% or so are um, Pell eligible, so of lower economic status. And the, uh, also about 70% of them work. So we have a variety of, you know, in, 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 in addition to this incredible diversity, we have a lot of what we hear recently the term non-traditional students. We have students that come, that then leave and go work and come back to us. Uh, in addition to having some students, obviously, that come to us full time, live on campus. So a very dynamic, very vibrant place to work with, uh, with, with all of that. We have urban institutions. We have large ones. There are four or five that are the size of the University of Maryland, about 40,000 students, uh, everywhere down to about 1,000. So really a lot of interesting uh, things going on in our, in our campuses. The way that I've been most directly involved with them over the last um, I'd say five years or so is through a central initiative called the Graduation Initiative. And with that effort, it, it sounds kind of silly whenever I talk about the Graduation Initiative to non-higher education people because the first thing they'll say is, you mean you're all of a sudden in the business of graduating students? <laughs> what happened before? <laughs> uh, the idea behind our Graduation Initiative is just using data, using metrics to put a stake in the ground and become more intentional about what we're doing for student success and whether or not it's working. And so we have, for each of our 23 campuses, established goals and targets for the year 2025 for completion rates for their transfer students and for their uh, freshman, full-time freshman students as well. Uh, we, have, we, we aggregate those up to system-level goals. And more importantly, we have goals to close the achievement gap. And by that, I mean the graduation rates, the delta, the difference between the graduation rates of our most underserved students uh, and, and their peers. And so with that work, uh, over the past, I would say, uh, five years, about five years ago, I went to the, each of the campuses with a, a group of three other people from the system office with the goal of understanding the progress that they were making towards their completion targets and their, and, and their plans. And so as we went to these um, uh, campuses, we spoke with everyone on campus, really, all the major campus groups. We met with faculty, we met with administrators, we met with the president, we met with students, and everywhere in between. And it was really interesting to hear how the different folks were approaching this. Some were very coordinated, some were, were not. Uh, but we got the usual interesting um, display of programs. So we'd have um, someone running an undergraduate research program show us the, show what's, what's going on and share just a very little bit of high-level data. Same with summer programs, same with um, first-year experience programs, same with summer, um, uh, summer bridge or um, uh, junior year abroad programs. And they all look terrific. But when we would ask these folks, well, which one of these programs is uh, having the best benefit for your Latino students? we'd often be met with stares of, well, we, we haven't looked at that yet. That's a good question. Uh, the other question we'd often ask the provost is, five years ago was a terrible, but maybe the worst budget time, at least in recent memory, for the state of California, probably for you folks as well. And so the question was, if you had to make, uh, if you had to double down and, let's say, put more, more money in your learning community or your uh, undergraduate research, which one is having the, bi the biggest differential benefit for your students, and how do you know? Again, no idea what was going on with that. So it, be, it came really uh, apparent to me in my role at the time that we needed to do better with the data that we had. And in our system office, I, know, I don't believe it's the same way here, but in our system office, we collect all of the data from the campuses about enrollments, about whether or not students, uh, all about their students' background. We know whether students are, what courses they're taking. So we have all this information that comes to us, and we've always used it for the sole purpose of compliance reporting for iPads. Uh, and it be became really apparent to me 
that there's a need to share that data, reflect it back to the campuses, and let them know, especially in actionable ways, what's happening not only on their campus, but on sister CSU campuses, and what can they do about it. And then use that as a framework, a collector framework, not to castigate, not to point out who was doing badly, but to create conversations, create cultures of inquiry. So that was the real basis behind the development of the system-wide tool that we created. Our audience started being at the highest level. We started with our chancellor who was on board. Our chancellor had us meet with the campus presidents who at first were very nervous about this. Uh, and so the result of that meeting was uh, I needed to delay the launch of the dashboard by about six months and go and meet with every one of our campus presidents individually to walk them through and assure them that you know, our intentions were, uh, were good. And so that did take some extra time, but it was well worth it. And now what we have is uh, really we have most of our, our um, uh, senior administrators on board. We have the chancellor on board with this and we have brought faculty in, which we'll see um, as well. We're gonna take now a system perspective. So from where I sit in the system office, these areas uh, of leveraging data for the individual student are critically important, and we look at that, but we aggregate that data up. So I want you to think about what I mentioned before as the setup, which is here I am with a group of folks. We go to all 23 campuses. We have a variety of discussions, and now we're taking the data to try to reflect back to the campuses, starting with the individual student record data, aggregating it up to show patterns. So I'm going to start to demo um, a few of the um, resources that we have in our dashboard and give you the context for it. So the, the dashboard is um, uh, password protected because it does have student level data, but when you come in, you come to a home page that gives you some facts about your campus. You'll see on the left here that we have a series of reports that campuses can look at. The first one I'm going to show you is this one here called, um, called Leading Indicators and Predictors, what we mean about that. So as we went to the campuses, what we noticed when we talked to them about their various policies, policies for when do students need to declare a major? Do they have to complete their general education requirements in a certain period of time? How many units are advisors telling students to take based on um, the research and based on the, the campus practice? We noticed that campuses had different policies across the board. And so what we did is we started working with some of the campuses and we collected data about these student academic behaviors. So if you look at the left, these are those behaviors, or at least a few of them for which we collected data. We had uh, the completion of general education English, and this campus is Northridge, one of our larger campuses. Uh, we looked at students who completed general education in their first two years of enrollment, students who completed 24 or more units in their first year, uh, completing general education math in the first two years. Now the difference in that next one, that 24 or more baccalaureate units, is that just means that the student came in completely ready, did not have to take our developmental education courses, which actually don't count as baccalaureate units. So there's that group, and the last one is a community, uh, completed a student success course. Most of our campuses have an introduction to the university learning skills type of course, uh, which they offer there. So when we put the data here, what you see on the left is, um, the darker bar represents the six-year graduation rate for students who did not complete that policy or that requirement, did not fulfill that. And the bar to the right, the much higher bar in every case, the purple bar shows the six-year graduation rates for students who did. So the very first thing we did was collect the data and just show this as is. And we had discussions with a, a, a lot of administrators and it was very hard for them um, to really interpret this data. What are you telling me? What should I do? How should I look at this? And so we realized that for our audience, especially for provosts and deans and for um, you know, high, higher level um, management on the, or administrators on the academic affairs side of the house for which this pertained, we needed to be able to break it down into something that was easily understandable. And so what we did is we, we picked one of those areas, we ran a model, which I'll walk you through in a second, to, predict, to, use one, to, to find the one variable that seemed to be the most salient or it seemed to, to be responsible for the most positive variance. In this case, for this campus, we tell them, Northridge, if you have to look at the academic policies that you gave us and the outcomes that we see, we think that you should really focus on getting more students to complete 24 or more units in the first year. In other words, if you were to focus on one thing out of the data you gave us, we think you would have the most positive impact if you were to advise your students to um, complete 24 more units in the first year. Now we have 23 campuses, and when you look at other campuses, other variables come out as being the most salient. The way that we got there is we have a statistician who ran 
a fancy model, a hierarchical logistic regression model, putting in these different variables at different times into the equation, controlling for things like uh, students' academic background, their, their test scores that they, ha they had, race, gender, ethnicity, all these things so that we're trying to level the playing field. And then as we put in each block, each group of variables independently, we were looking at the variance that, that uh, uh, the positive variance uh, we came up with, and this, this shows it right here, we actually walk people through what we did, we explain to them what we did, we give them the advice, and then at the bottom here, so to really uh, enforce the idea that we're not trying to be researchers here, we're trying to help folks look at their own policies and maybe make a difference, we threw in a what-if analysis based on this modeling. So on the bottom here, this slider allows me to say, well, what if I'm at Northridge and I'm the provost and I'm able to increase the percentage of students, oh, let me, I'm sorry, let me scroll over here, it looks like it's off the screen a little bit, let's not, not let me do it. Um, but I can see that if I increase the uh, percentage of Northridge freshmen who complete 24 or more units in the first year by 17 percentage points, that their six-year graduation rates would be uh, predicted to increase by 7.6%, which is another 317 students graduating. So when you do this, and you can see you know, the models there, the, the, uh, it's not just a one for one, this is modeling out based on the variables we know. Nothing's perfect, I wouldn't take this to the bank, I wouldn't stake my job on it, but at least it gives the folks on that campus, first of all, a plan of action, uh, a plan to discuss amongst themselves, what do we do about this? Do we agree that this is a, a, an issue that we want to take a look at? And it gives them a sense of if they're able to move in the direction where, uh, where, where we're recommending, what the in potential impact might be. So this is just one way that we're able to take a bunch of different information from the campuses and then Northridge might look at another campus who also has similar issues around 24 or more units, whereas some of the other campuses where it's uh, general education math have come together as well. So this is just one example of how we've used data to look at academic behaviors. Now what about academic programs? I heard a little bit of conversation amongst uh, folks about the programs that you're involved with and some of the programs that you run. The idea here was if we go back to that model that I told you, we go to the campus and we ask for, well, what's happening with student success on your campus? We hear about undergraduate research, we hear about the great summer programs, we hear about internships, we hear about all these high impact practices, but we're not really sure what's having uh, 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 the positive effect. And this is really tough, right? We could take years and years and years and have controlled samples and really look um, uh, at, 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 you know, ha have a bunch of researchers really dig in to see what's going on. But we, what we thought we would do from the system office is run some automated program to create uh, as close to an apples to apples comparison as we could of the participants versus the non-participants. So let me show you this. Right now we're looking at summer bridge program at Northridge. Let me go to the bottom to, uh, to start with. So we used a statistical model called propensity score match. And the idea there is we took the look at the participants who, who um, uh, engaged in the summer bridge program over the summer. And we looked at several variables. Here's some of the variables that we put into the model about them. So ELM is our entry level math exam with a score of I think 20 to 80 is the score on that test, the, the range. EPT is our English placement test lower division units, their SAT score, whether or not they were Pell eligible, and URM is underrepresented minority. But the idea is we took of the 197 students who participated in 2009, I believe, in this program, we then found out of, um, Northridge has about 5,000 freshmen every year, of the other freshmen who weren't participating, we found 197 who looked just like them, who had similar characteristics. And on the bottom here, these statistics, the closeness of them show me that I have a pretty good match. At least for the, the variables that we chose in our model, I have a good match. Now there's other variables that we obviously don't have. We couldn't, you know, we won't know the motivation. There's some self-selection. There's all sorts of things going on here that we're not looking at. But on paper here, this gives us at least some semblance of, a, a, of, of an apples to apples uh, comparison of similar students. And when we do that, we now have the outcome variables of retention, year to year retention, and um, eventual graduation that we can look at to compare them. So what this is showing me is that for participants in 2009 in Northridge, the 83% uh, of them who participated in the Summer Bridge program were there and enrolled the next spring in 2010, whereas in my control group it was only 73%. Uh, What's nice, and I'll tell you in a minute why I'm showing you this program, but if I fast forward and say, well, what about second year? I see that that, that nice bump is still there. Third year persistence, 
look at that, I still have a 13 percentage point uh, improvement in that group or, or, or uh, similar in fourth year. Fifth year, um, it, it dives down a little bit, but sixth year, look at this. Look at that significant difference. And the reason I showed you Northridge was because there are all sorts of permutations. There are different cohort years, there are different programs, as you can see. Most of our programs will follow this bell curve. So some of them are on the left side of the bell curve of year after year. They, don't seem, they seem to actually ha be having a, a negative effect. In other words, students are doing worse at those programs, or very few of them. Most of them, you see a lot of variance year to year, cohort year to cohort year. Sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad. You know, sometimes students seem to be doing well, sometimes not. There's a lot of noise there. And then there's a few select programs out of all of them that we have that year after year seem to be having a positive impact. And I'm not going to take the time to show you, but this program came to the top. And compared to other campuses, most the pattern that we'd see with most campuses is that from year one to year two retention, you'd see a nice bump but it would wash out, and then by the time you got to graduation rates, whether four year or six year, it was about even. And so just to show you how, you know, I mentioned the culture of inquiry, and you, you stated that in the back, how do we use this data? Well, about a year and a half ago, I went to a meeting of, um, they're called our summer bridge directors, they asked me to present and talk about the data. And so I spent all of 10 minutes. I didn't actually find this until I you know, spent 10 minutes kind of looking through the data. And I went into the meeting and I talked a little bit about um, what we were doing at the dashboard. And I said, by the way, there's one program in particular at Northridge, their commuter student summer bridge program, that seems to be having a really positive effect. And I showed him this and I said, I know the data tells me this isn't accidental. Well, the summer bridge director at Northridge raised his hand, and he did, and he said, I said, I don't like to put you on the spot, but can you tell your peers there's got to be something that you're doing beyond that first year that other folks in this room probably aren't doing that accounts for this success? And he kind of was embarrassed a little bit, but he said, yeah, there is. We have peer mentors. Our summer bridge program doesn't end at the end of the first year. We, look, we view it as a community. We have meetings, we have pizza, we have, you know, so he talked about how he has budget that goes all the way through and how the, these results were not accidental. So again, these are the kind of things that these, the meetings with our summer bridge directors, with advisors when we bring them together, with our admissions directors, they're often just about business, right? We, we talk about procedures, we talk about new laws, we talk about um, what's happening at, on our campuses a little bit. We rarely use data in this intentional and overt way to call out successes and to really understand what's going on behind them. So that's one thing that I encourage you, as I heard you talking, uh, uh, to do with your data to the extent that you're able to. The last thing I want to show you, and then I'm going to give you some time to play with this tool. So this is the time to kind of concentrate, because when you have hands-on time, you'll be playing with this tool. As part of the dashboard, we, I, I think I mentioned so far, our first focus was on the administration getting buy-in at a fairly high level. And then we quickly realized that nothing is going to happen of meaning and of substance uh, to move our numbers without getting faculty really uh, involved. I mean, our faculty are so instrumental both inside and outside of the classroom to the to student learning experience um, that we needed to bring them into the fold as well. And so our goals with faculty was a little, was, were a little bit different. I mean, our goals with faculty were, um, the, the problem we were trying to solve is that our faculty typically get a very specific point in time view of a student based on the course they're teaching, and that's about it. So for example, if you're a biologist at uh, one of our, at, let's say Chico, and you're teaching the Intro to Biology survey course, you see a heck of a lot of freshmen. Um, but you don't know what happens, you don't know, what hap you don't know their background before they came to you, and you certainly don't know in most cases what happened afterwards. And so the goal of our dashboard was just none of this fancy predictive modeling, no, you know, nothing fancy, it was just descriptive statistics to show them, here are your students and here's what's happening. So an example that we start with is uh, the courses that they teach. And so everything we do in this part of the dashboard goes down to the, either the college, the department, <coughs> the major, or the course level. In this case, we're looking at all of them. So I've chosen San Jose State. This is an analysis of which courses do they struggle. Um, so in which courses do your students have difficulty? We're looking at San Jose State, their College of Science. We're looking at all departments. If we wanted to, if we wanted to look at biology, as I mentioned, we could just focus on biology. But these, all of the, the circles on the um, chart below represent a course taught in that, ver in, in this case, in that college. And the x-axis here is the percentage of non-passing grades, the percentage of students who receive a D, an F or an unauthorized withdrawal, which 
counts as a non-passing grade. So the further to the right, that's not a good sign for our students. Um, the x-axis and also the size of the bubble, both of these, have to do with the total number of enrollments. And so, and so what we did, and I want, I want to point out something that was very intentional, Again, we're dealing with audiences that are very busy, that really want to know within 30 seconds what are the issues here. And so that's why you'll notice a one, two, and three on the chart, and a one, two, three on top, which are identifying the combination of both the highest enrollment and the lowest success courses by college or by department or, uh, uh, or by major here, so that quickly a provost or a faculty member, associate dean can hone in and say, boy, it looks like if we we're gonna look at course redesign or really look at the student experience, in this case, our general chemistry class, our calculus one class, and our pre-calc class are the areas where we should start. And so this bubble chart allows us to roll over each one of these and get more information. In this case, here's a Calc 1 with pre-calc. It tells me that it's got a DFW rate of 33%. One in three students who enroll aren't passing. We're probably not seeing a lot of surprises. I think there must be some STEM faculty here because I'm seeing some nodding heads. I'm sure you see some of the same things. This outlier over here is the Intro to Physics course where um, 170, uh, excuse me, 400 enrollments with 44% DFW rate. So it really gives you a sense of everything in between what's going on. Now if I wanted to focus only on my upper division courses, I could easily just click off everything else and say, well, what's happening in upper division if that were my focus? You know, again, this gives faculty a real good sense of what's going on. I will also tell you, you run into politics, and uh, you know, for me, the politics were this. I had some pressure in my office to show this not at the course le section, le excuse me, the course level, but the section level. Now the politics involved with that is I'd in a sense be saying, that's Jeff Gold who's teaching that Gen Chem course. Uh, I don't want to be in that business. I mean, that's why they pay the provost the big money, right? Um, <laughs> or the deans. Uh, but this allows um, a provost or a dean to then go back to their own college data and say, well, let's take a look. Why, you know, what's happening? And one of the questions would be, we're having a problem with general chemistry. Is that because of the pedagogy? Is it, is it an academic preparation um, or student support issue where we can provide some supplemental instruction? Does it have to do, and this happens to us a lot, we, we look under the covers and we see that it's, it may sometimes be neither. It may be faculty just are grading on a curve. And they are traditionally saying we are, we are going to fail 40% of the class regardless of um, how they do on our exams. And so these are conversations that sometimes haven't come to light but we're helping to bring to light. I, I think I mentioned before, um, Another critical component of the work we're doing and really the essence, what gets me up in the morning and so excited about our job with our mission and, who, and the students we serve is the commitment to close achievement gaps for all of our students. And so what we've done with this analysis is we've taken all the courses you just saw and we've now looked at a, the achievement gap in GPA performance in those courses between what we call our underrepresented minority, we really don't like that term, but it's one that's used nationally, underrepresented minority for us means African American, Latino, and um, Native American students, and non-underrepresented minority is everyone else. So those are the two groups we're looking at here. We can look at this chemistry class right here, the larger the line, I'm now looking at the largest gap courses, so the largest achievement gap in grade um, uh, in the sciences at San Jose. And I can see top on the list is this looks like chemical calculations course. It has 196 students. It looks like most students are getting somewhere between a C plus and a B minus. That seems to be the average. Um, my underrepresented students, of which there are 70, have an average GPA of 2.04 in this course, and my non-underrepresented students at 2.93. And there are 126 of them. So, there could be good reasons for this. There could be, this isn't to say that the faculty members are discriminating against their underrepresented minorities, but this is information that they had never seen before. It allows them to really be intentional about it. It allows them to understand what's going on. Um, the other thing that, our, one of our next analyses that we plan to do is that for our courses that have freshmen, we can't do it with transfers. But our, our courses that are mostly freshman based, we want to control for their academic preparation. Because on some campuses we show this data and it's hard to get beyond the fact that they will say, well, you know, of course my underrepresented students are coming from schools where they're not getting the same background in terms of the rigor, so they come to us and we're not surprised, what do you want us to do? Um, you know, and to that we can say, well, that, you know, that, that's why we have academic support, we want supplemental instruction, we want to figure out how we take ownership of the learning process and we support all our students where they are. 
But when that doesn't ring home, we have a pretty strong feeling that if we're able to run models to control for academic preparation, we will still see achievement gaps in many of our courses, and that's an area uh, where we can focus on. For example, in this, um, I was presenting this to one of our campuses a few weeks ago, and someone in the mathematics department was surprised to find that there were more achievement gaps at the upper division math level than the lower division which is really interesting, if you, and that's a huge problem, right? Because if you're passing through the courses on their campus and making it to those upper division, more advanced math courses, and then you're seeing achievement gaps, you know, that's something that the campus needs to take ownership of. So the idea here was to create these conversations at the department, at the course level with faculty, and then not to just look at the negative, we also, what's great about, you know, the power of the dashboards we create is we can run the data many different ways and then present it in different ways. So I can now say, well, what about the smallest gaps? Is it that every course has this huge problem, this huge discrepancy? And the answer is no. So here's a math course um, with 150 students and there's a computer science course with 700 students with no achievement gap whatsoever. And so, you know, again, just to emphasize here, there's nothing fancy about what we're doing. This is pretty basic data, pretty basic aggregation of what's happening at the course level, but the types of discussions that this has created in itself uh, are discussions that we frankly haven't had before since I've been with the system of over the last 12 years. The last thing I'm going to show you, and I'm going to welcome you to then to play around with you know, all, of the, all of the tools, but I, I recommend you focus on these three. Going back to how I set this up, which is you know, you're a faculty member, you're a biology professor, let's say at Chico, you're teaching that survey course. You want to own more of the student experience and take, take ownership of the, um, make sure your students succeed, but you really are only seeing students at one point in time and you, you, it's hard for you to create a relationship with them, especially if they're not coming to office hours. And so this tool here um, that we developed allows um, by department, for every department we have, for faculty to see, for students who came to the campus with a declared major in, that, uh, in their discipline, in their area, what happened to those students over time. So this is the one, if you remember that first um, cartoon that I showed you where the wacky things, all the charts, and you know, be prepared to you know, uh, get nauseous via data. Well, this one is a little bit complex, so stay with me on this one. But we see here that we're looking at San Jose we're now looking at their College of Business, students with a declared major in management who came to the campus in 2009 as first time freshmen. And there's six potential outcomes here, um, all checked off. The dark green graduated same major means I came as a management major and I graduated within six years, six years or earlier, with, that, with a degree in, in management. The graduated different major came with management in mind, changed my major, but still graduated. Second one is enrolled, so I'm still enrolled, um, same major, different major. Last one is I dropped out, so I left the university with this major or I changed my major ahead of time. Um, so for this campus, there were 123 students with that declared major back in 2009. The x-axis here is year by year, what happened to the students year by year, and the y-axis is their credit accumulation year to year. So we can really see both by color and by their movement what's happening to these students, and each one of these icons represents one actual student. So when I hit play, I can see in the first year, and I'll explain the yellow in a minute, a lot of red, those students all left the university right away in that first year. Second year, more red. Third year, unfortunately, more red. Fourth year, we start to see some fourth year graduates there, which is terrific. Fifth year, a lot more graduates, although some red. And sixth year, we see you know, a lot of green and some red. So what does this tell you? If you were, if you were teaching management, if you're a professor of manage, business management at San Jose State, this is data you've never seen before. Starting with the scorecard on the right, it tells you, you know, at the highest level, something you maybe didn't know. There were 123 students who came to you, 2009. 11% of them, or this group right here, um, that group graduated in four years. Um, the next group in, uh, over, excuse me, or, um, the, 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 the whole group here, all together, all the greens, are 62%, so not, not a terrible number for us. Um, but interestingly, underneath that, 46% of the graduates um, graduated with, within this major. So there's a question to be asked right there, why are more than half of the students who come with this major in mind changing majors? 
Does it have to do with the curriculum? Does it have to do with, you know, uh, it could be a variety of things. But what's going on there? That's a question that they probably didn't know that they want to look into. Uh, the average total units at graduation doesn't look super high at 126 when our, you know, that, that degree requires 120. For some degrees, that's very high. So the question is, why are they accumulating these extra units? What courses are they taking? Then we look at the dropout rate down below, 33%. So one in three students are dropping out. And out of those, half of them, about half of them are happening in that first year. That's an issue, right? So the next question you might want to ask is, are these students in good academic standing? Does it have to do with the rigor of the curriculum or their preparation or you know, something that we need to do to support their success more or, why, or something else? I mean, you mentioned a little bit about a you know, career um, survey. You know, what about a survey of our students who leave as well so that we really understand what is it, especially in this major, if you were to think about they're able to really shore up that first year and really get to the root cause of that, what that would do for their graduation rates. Um, the last one I'll show you, just go to the yellow on the bottom, which is we marry this data set to a larger National Student Clearinghouse data set so that we're not just looking at what the official definition of a dropout or a success story is. And in this case, the official federal definition of a dropout is if you didn't start at this university and complete at this university, you're considered a dropout. But for our records, we have additional records. Those are the one in yellow. They actually started at San Jose State, and then they, they left San Jose State in the first and second year in this case, and they went on and graduated within six years from another institution. So what's nice about this tool is I can roll over the student and we can look and see, here's a student who dropped out with 60, so first year 30 units, 64 units, dropped out, graduate, went on to graduate from Cal Lutheran. Um, what the other thing this tool allows you to do is you can see for some who didn't make it, so here's a student, Look at all these units, 24 units, 54, 79. So this student is, is hanging on, going all the way throughout, gets to the sixth year with 150 units and does not complete. I mean, we see that a lot, right? Maybe, let's hope, the student got a really good job, but then the issue becomes, can we reach out to the student? Maybe they need to take one course. Can we be flexible? Can we really look into these opportunities? There's just a lot of discussions for faculty who get so focused on their discipline, their course, there's a lot of discussions about student success that can emanate here. And then before I leave you to kind of explore on your, your own, I'll just let you know, I think you can understand how someone from the system office, this is the level of data that seems about right for someone from the system office. What this does though, is it opens up the potential for just really powerful conversations, um, you know, about tools like we had a discussion about Civitas and other tools uh, before, before uh, we began today, you know, other tools that can be used underneath to really support student success. I think most of our faculty are really bought into our mission. So even though they're you know, entirely focused on both research and the courses, they also have a huge personal investment in the success of our students. I think that's more true maybe for us than, more, than most other institutions. Faculty come to us because of our mission uh, uh, um, uh, in many cases. And so we have that, so it makes the conversations easier because when faculty see this, when I present to our faculty, I usually get them, my God, I never knew. But then, as you're right, I, then the next questions are, well, what can I do about it, right? And so I think it really comes down to, I, you know, I often view this as um, the peeling of the onion. This is the first layer, but then this should lead you to a series of maybe more sophisticated questions about your students that will help you get to the what do I do about it. So I, I walked us through a couple of them, but when we see, so what, what's salient to me when I look at this? And again, I don't know these students, I don't know the campus that well, so you have to take what I'm saying with a grain of salt. But where I would start looking, if I were a management, if we put our you know, uh, faculty hats on, we say we're management faculty, what would I start to look at? That first area of losing 20 students, 20 out of 123, in that first year is just you know, striking to me. That, you know, more, about half of your dropouts are happening in the first year. I'd wanna know why, and whether it's a survey of those students, um, the, but you know, before I'd survey, I'd, I'd wanna look, you know, look at their academic standing when they left, I wanna look at their grades, I wanna look when they're leaving. So just a lot of questions about what's going on there, and then there's a question of who's teaching those introductory courses, those first courses. Are they tenure track faculty? Are they lecturers? What kind of support are those students getting? What other courses are they taking? Are they succeeding in the other courses? So I think the question of how do we go about um, providing support, what can a faculty member do? 
you know, some of our, our you know, I know that um, Ben was mentioning to me last night that, um, you know, there's a series of course redesign academic transformation projects here. You know, this could be the focus. So this could be how do we, the focus could be that those first year management courses to really take a look at them with the goal of providing additional student support, changing the pedagogy to meet the students. So that's just one example, but I, I think it's not an easy endeavor. These aren't, this data does not provide you an easy solution to say, go do this. Um, but it does open conversations with people who are committed to the work to get them to a place where they'll get there. I thought I'd just take one last minute to go over just some final thoughts with you. You know, the, the first thing is, and I hope this became clear, um, you may not know it, depending on where you are or what you do, the data will be different, but I guarantee that for your department and for what you're doing, there are valuable insights in your data. And so if one of the takeaways for you from today is to really think about the data you collect, I know some of it may not be um, totally clean and perfect, but even with those, um, uh, with those problems, your data do contain insights. The second is kind of related to what I just said, which is do not let the perfect be the enemy of good. I am not an instructional, I'm not an institutional research uh, person. I am not reporting on compliance. If I'm off by a couple, the patterns are still the same. You know, where we are now, a good place to start is just think about what are the high level patterns telling you. And if you can get data to tell you that, then the next question about what you do about it, 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 it comes up. And the last thing is that it really begins with you. So the last takeaway is, you know, in the next time that you meet with your, if you're faculty with your um, fellow faculty, a department meeting, or if you're advisors and you meet with your colleagues, Really, I challenge you to really think about how you can change some of the conversations. If you think about the meetings that we have and how they're so policy uh, focused, can you uh, intentionally make time for data in the discussion at every meeting that you have about student success? So again, thanks for coming. I'll be here for a while. You're welcome to explore the site. Really enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs>